Thank you for coming to worship this morning. It's good to be here with you all today. A uh, couple things that I want, I want to want to share with you before we get started. One, um, these might be the uh, the world's worst uh, Bible readings um, to go with uh, uh, any message of hope and grace. So so bear with me as we go with it. But also. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our uh, our choir anthem for the day. We had uh, we originally had had planned a different song, um, and uh, uh, one of the one of the features of this piano over here is that it can record music. Um, and uh, uh, and we had Joylin um, play uh, uh, play the song into it before she went in for surgery. And, uh, and we rehearsed with it, we rehearsed with it, we rehearsed with it. Um, after Joylin passed, the song disappeared off the memory of the, of the piano. And so uh, we went to a, uh, a, a song that uh, uh, our choir has known for a long time, also a song that was one of uh, Joylin's favorites, and that she would get to sing along with us for. So, uh, glad to have that opportunity to share and remember in that way. So this is the time of the church year, the end of Pentecost, the beginning of Advent, that we hear gospel lessons about the return of Christ, the day of the Lord, of us facing rescue and judgment. And all the images that we get, and I'm going to kind of layer it over the, over last week, over a couple weeks. Uh, this week and also the, the, the next week. Um, we get bridesmaids and oil lamps. We get servants and vast wealth. We get solar and lunar eclipses. We get sheep and goats. And these images are often confusing and contradictory. I ask myself, are we supposed to stockpile resources like the maidens and the extra oil? Or are we supposed to give it all away to people in need, like the sheep and the goats? Are we called to save what we have been entrusted, like the servant with one talent? Or are we to engage in risky investments, like the servant with the five talents? And we could spend the next 20 minutes, if you would like, talking about first century wedding rituals, uh, master-slave relationships in the ancient Middle East, or the cultural obligation of hospitality in Jesus' time. I'm not sure that would be entirely helpful uh, to any of us in our everyday lives. So, I want to look at a currency, a value that appears in the parable of the bridesmaids and oil lamps, the parable of the slaves and the talents, and Jesus' teaching about his return next Sunday as well. And when we think currency, a lot of times we think money, right? <coughs> but the one that shows up in all three lessons is time. In all of these teachings, there is an element of the uncertainty of time. We hear it in our lesson today, verse 19, it says, After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. So my question for you this morning, feel free to raise your hand and participate, how long is a long time? Yes, yes Tyson. 200 years. 200 years, that's a good guess. Yes, sir. 3,000. 3,000 years. That last 30 minutes of work. <laughs> <laughs> Unknown of a long time. A long time, it's, yeah, it could depend, right? I mean, how many women have been pregnant in here? How long is that nine months? <laughs> you know? Uh, it, how many kids in here? How long of a time is it till Christmas morning? You know, it depends. It depends on, 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 our, on our idea. There is an uncertainty and unpredictability till time. And this was made abundantly clear to me this week with our organist, Joy Lynn's sudden death. <coughs> Ten days ago, she went in for surgery to repair a broken hip. 
and she was recovering so well. I saw her a couple of times that week, and I took her communion because she couldn't make it to church that Sunday. And I got this text on Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon, that Joylyn wasn't feeling good. <coughs> they were running a bunch of tests and moving her over to intensive care for observation. So I uh, headed over to the hospital, and uh, um, I remember looking at my communion kit, because it always sits in my car with me. And I was like, ah, you know, do I take it? You know, I just gave her communion. You know what I mean? Like, these things roll through your head. And I was like, well, uh, you know, I'll get her next time, you know, cause, because, because, you know, if, if things get any worse, you know, I'll go back and, and we'll, we'll catch up. It'll, it'll be all right. There will be more time, right? We visited and we prayed. Joylyn was upbeat and positive. The next morning I woke to news that Joylyn was on a ventilator. That evening I held her hand as they turned off the machines, keeping her alive. We do not know the day or the hour. There is an uncertainty to our time, and none of us have any guarantees. I don't say this to frighten us or depress us but rather to reveal a truth that we rarely talk about. Our time, like our finances, is a limited commodity. How will we invest it? Perhaps this is one message from the parable of the talents for me and maybe for some of you all this morning. I don't know much about investments. And yet, what percentage increase do both the first and the second servant turn on the money entrusted to them? What percent? One hundred percent return on their investment. They double. For those of you who are versed in investment, how much risk do you have to take to double your investment? A lot of risk. Yeah, these two managed to double the money they were in charge of, but they could have just as easily lost it all. The modern equivalent of $5 million and $2 million of somebody else's money. Unless you're a politician, you don't usually get away with that. Uh, what if Jesus is trying to tell us that following him, being a disciple, will require risk? And I'm not talking about just money. I'm talking about more valuable and more personal commodities, like our feelings, like our hopes, like our very breath and life. I wonder if when Jesus speaks of his imminent return, it is an invitation for each of us, our church, to live our lives fully. All right, I want, to, I want you to hear me carefully. That this is an invitation to live our lives fully. Not recklessly, but fully. And this requires risk. Who here has ever told somebody that they love them? Who here has ever been the first to say it? <laughs> Love is risky. Service is risky. How many people have ever served and felt like they got taken advantage of? Forgiveness is risky. Giving, generosity is, is risky. If you think about it, most major elements and actions within the Christian faith require risk and vulnerability. An investment of, of ourselves into what God is up to in our world. I told you earlier that I missed out on an opportunity to bring Joy Lynn communion one last time. And this isn't a heaven or hell thing, all right? We all know that Joy Lynn is kicking it with Jesus right now, all right? She's out of pain. She is in a good place. And yet I missed out on the joy that I always saw on Joy Lynn's face 
when she received the Lord's Supper. I missed sharing a meal with my friend one last time. And what this reminds me, and maybe what this reminds all of you, is maybe it just can't wait. Have you been putting off apologizing to somebody? Have you put off asking for forgiveness from someone? Have you put off reconciling with a friend or with a family member? Is there somebody you love but you haven't told them? Go, right now. Seriously, do it. It isn't about saving someone. It isn't about saving someone else. It isn't about saving ourselves. Jesus has already done that. This is about living into the kingdom of God here and now. <coughs> Experiencing our master's joy here and now. And there's always that little voice in the back of our head, right? What if we fail? What if the person rejects us? What if we waste our time? I'm not sure it's possible to waste your time when it is spent in pursuit of love, service, and reconciliation with your neighbor. I'll give you an example, and we'll end here for the day. Earth Day 2017, Lafayette Community Garden. All right, we're kicking off our year in the garden. We've got all these uh, agencies coming in, setting up tents. We've got chickens, live chickens. We've got, uh, we've got frozen smoothies. We've got uh, uh, the dedication of the little library coming up. All the events before, we've, we've had like 125, 150 guests. What did it do that day? Who was there? It poured rain. It was so cold. <laughs> Nobody wanted any smoothies. We had a few kids and a few folks come down from the neighborhood, but the attendance was mostly volunteers and church members. My wife was a little bummed on the way home because she had been planning this whole thing and organizing it. She asked me, she asked me, how do you think it went? And I said, I think it went great. And I wasn't sure if she was going to um, to punch me at that point. <laughs> but I realized that we didn't have a whole lot of people show up. But we can work on attendance and advertising, right? But this was an event that was across town. It wasn't in our building. It wasn't something that directly benefited us. And we had over 30 people show up from our, from our church. We had them show up on a cold, rainy day, give up their Saturday in order to show love and give food and books to people that they've never met before. How awesome is that? We can always get more guests. But our volunteers and congregation members' presence means that they're willing to take a risk to love and to serve complete strangers. That's the kingdom of God right there. That's discipleship. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.